This is literally the people, the woman that will be talking is the person behind CSGO Skins who pushed it forward. You will see. You will see. Just a reminder before we start to silence your cell phones. This is her. I'm Bronwyn. I'm a technical artist at Valve. And today I'm going to be discussing the what's, how's, and why's of the content that drives the Counter-Strike global it a try. offensive economy. So what is this talk? I should first start by telling you what it isn't. I'm not going to spend a long time talking about the advantages of adding an economy to your game. I'm going to assume that the reason you're here is you already have an idea about that. If, on the other hand, that is something you want to learn some, some more about, um, we recently gave a series of talks at the Steam Developer Days on economies. Chat, just so you know, this, look, market, boom, it talks about skins and everything. This is, bro, uh, this is, you see the, the, the thoughts behind and as well, it will explain maybe why Valve does certain things. Mm, with skins and if they don't, just watch it. Economy. I would so say. what is this talk? I should first start by telling you what it isn't. I'm not going to spend a long time talking about the advantages of adding an economy to your game. I'm going to assume that the reason you're here is you already have an idea about that. If on the other hand, that is something you want to learn some, some more about. Um, we recently gave a series of talks at the Steam Developer Days on economies. All that content's really available to watch on YouTube. So just head over to steamdevdays.com for some links. So instead, this talk is about how we generated a large volume of content with a really small team in order to kickstart our economy. I'll be discussing the things that our customers value about- Super small. Is it okay if I pause a lot, chat, if I can give my input? CSGO team, it is, uh, I think if you, if you do the calculations, amount of money earned per employee, bro, CSGO is, is going to be Probably number one, probably number one. The amount of money that they generate with CSGO cases, with the Steam community market, with CSGO is ridiculous. And the team that works on CSGO is a handful. It is ridiculous. The team is so small. This is why things are moving so slow. It is nuts. I think, is it like 14 people or something? It's literally a handful. Ridiculous. About the economy content and how that information is helping us continue to make good decisions going forward. Counter-Strike is an online multiplayer game. It's a team-based first-person shooter, and it's had several ver uh, versions over the last 14 years. Counter-Strike Global Offensive is the latest, greatest version, like we do with our other products. We use Steam to update CSGO regularly as we strive to create the best experience possible. In a multiplayer game, a big part of having a good experience is provided by other players. Our customers generate a huge amount of value for each other just by participating in the game. We want to encourage them to keep doing that, the way that we encourage them is uh, just by providing a bunch of fun and value to them. And Money. more importantly, by making it easy for them to provide a bunch of value to each other. In Valve products like Dota 2 and Team Fortress 2, we found that a great way to help meet all of these goals at once is to add an economy to the game. We can measure the success of our economy by checking in just on a few broad metrics, and they're maybe not the ones that you'd expect. After all, Adding the economy isn't a goal in and of itself. We're adding an economy in service of our other goals. So the kinds of things that we're going to check on are things like player numbers, player retention, and individual playtime. Because after all, if our customers are having fun, they're going to keep coming back for more. Chat, me personally, bro, if CSGO wouldn't have skins, <laughs> bro, I, what would I be doing? What would I be doing? Chat, I, wanna, I would love to see a second universe where, where I'm living Without me as a high school kid having found out about skins and going down that roadway, it, it, it just nerding out on skins and everything, what would I be doing, bro? McDonald's, bro. I mean McDonald's. It's it's McDonald's. Why not? I, I barista. Uh, yeah, barista maybe. Starbucks. No, I probably would be IT IT guy. Microsoft something. Not gonna lie. Since Team Fortress 2 and Dota 2 both have thriving economies, we were able to crib a bunch of ideas from them. They both use multiple channels for distributing items to their players. This gives customers lots of options for getting items. Having lots of ways for customers to interact with the economy is a big positive because it means a broader participation. And economies are essentially multiplayer games. The more people participating, the more fun it is. In both Team Fortress 2 and Dota 2, not every item is available through every channel. This is perfect when the goal is to provide lots of different ways to interact with the economy Smart. and to see how our customers want to consume content. But it's really difficult to directly compare the value of items in these different categories. And at this point in CSGO's economy design discussion, figuring out the value of individual items was actually really important. Because leaving aside the how for the moment, we still weren't sure what our customers wanted to consume. 
So let's focus for a second on the marketplace. This is one of the ways that our customers can get out the content. Customers can list items from their inventories for sale for Steam Wallet funds. The listings are in real currency amounts, and they're set by the lister. Because identical items can be listed for different amounts, there's a constant downward price pressure as um, the price pressure makes the supply and demand at a given price point equalize. So as a company, we had a unique opportunity. This was the first time that we were launching an economy since the market went live. We decided that CSGO would become our first game in which every item can be placed on the marketplace and individual items can't oh. be bought any other way. In fact, the only thing that we planned to sell directly were the keys used to open our case drops. So in this proposed market-centered economy, the supply of items comes from our players. They come from in-game drops, so the more players we have playing, the more supply there is. The demand also comes from our players. Pixel, They're only going to purchase things that um, they feel are being sold for a fair price. And with enough listings, the downward price pressure of the free market is going to ensure that a fair price gets... Chad, I, I always wonder if the CSGO team knows about the craziness going on, 100%, right? That a Titan holo is worth $50,000. That there's a knife that's worth $1.5 million. Because Steam, of course, they, they, they have a market cap, $2,000 or whatever. Of course they do. Yeah, 100, probably, right? I wonder if everybody working on CS knows about it, though. I don't know. Found. So this sounded like a great way to simply ask our customers what they value. So what did we decide to ship? What we the f***? Huh? CSGO.game banana. That's a real site? Bro, I feel like I'm always getting hacked when I see these links. Game banana. Bro, I clicked on it once and it put out my, my malware bytes uh, uh, thingy. <laughs> what the f***? Is game banana legit? Urban is sold. Bro, what is the skin though? We could make weapon skins, character customization. We could wait, do wait, wait, wait. Oh, this is so interesting, Chad. Look, the, here she talks about character customization, but agents got released so much later. It's crazy. Look, they have the thoughts. And, wow. Value. Execution much later. So what did we decide to ship? We could make weapon skins, character customization. Wow. We could do new weapons. Imagine now she says something like shoes. <laughs> and then ne next month they really, uh, let's see. Weapons, or we could just do cosmetic mesh changes to existing weapons. All these things have been modded by CS players in the past. In fact, all the examples that I just showed are community mods from Game Banana. So clearly there is a demand for customization. Whatever it was that we decided to ship, we needed to create a lot of items in order to fill out the economy. Yeah. So it's important that we make it as easy as possible to do so. And in keeping with our goal of helping our players generate value for each other, we'd like to make it possible for community members to contribute items to the game and make money from their in-game sales. We also need a lot of variety in order to figure Steam out... Steam Workshop as we know it today. You upload your skins, cre community creates skins, oh, you and you get um, juiced. Of course, the numbers are not uh, out there how much you make from having a skin in the game, right? But, uh, uh, bro, it's... it's it's it's, it's, it's it must be a ton. ...what our customers want. We know that economies are more fun when there are more people participating. They're also more fun when there are lots of items to compare and lots of different ways to compare them. Yeah. So we didn't want to just create items with a broad range of value. We also wanted to create items that could be valued in different ways because players with different priorities can actually care about different aspects of the same item. Yeah, yeah, so we'll pattern, float, condition. S some guy cares about the, 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 the nice pattern. One guy cares about the nice float. There's high float collectors. There's low float collectors. There's blue gem collectors. There's a crimson web collector. Oh my God, she, chat. They are so smart when it comes to building an in-game economy. Higher, bro, the, 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 uh, bro, priceless. What she's talking to her knowledge, priceless. I want to keep these goals in mind as we figure out which thing we want to start with. The way we choose which of our options to go with is to assess the benefits associated with Lord. each type of product and then compare that against the risks associated with shipping it and the resources. <laughs> Oh my, I'm so happy that we're watching this right now. Hearing this from the people behind the game chat. Is she still working at, at CSGO? 100%, right? Bro, look at this. They talk about agents, the risk versus the value. Oh my God. To actually complete the task. At the time, CSGO was actually a really small team. Our art team consisted of two technical artists, and that's the whole list. We were pretty resource limited. So let's take characters, for example. We know that customizable characters in TF2 and Dota 2 are really valuable and popular, but they work best when there's lots of chances to see the customization. In Dota 2, the game is top-down, so you get to see your character all the time. 
And in TF2, although it's a first-person game, there are taunts and kill cams that give you lots of opportunities to see your customization or show it off to other players. CSGO is also a first-person game, but we don't have taunts. So the chances to show off your customization are actually a lot fewer than our other products. And so the value here isn't maybe as high as we'd first hoped. Lol. There's also a lot of challenges here, and there's a big risk that we can make team identification difficult. Since CSGO is a team-based game, team ID is a really big part of yeah. having a good experience. So it's possible that someone could have a customized character, be really happy that they had something different and unique, but they made everybody else that they were playing with less happy because it was more difficult for everyone else to tell friend from foe. It's also... It's funny how she talks about the negatives of agents, but now zoom forward to 2020, 2022, and we have agents. Lol, this is, oh bro, this is so exciting, so exciting. Oh a God. big resource investment. Not only do we have to take time to try and solve our team ID problems, but there's a lot of content that needs to be created, and it's fairly complicated content. With our small team, it would take a really long time to make enough content to be able to ship the economy. That's bad for us, because we'd like to ship something as soon as possible, especially something that we have doubts about, because then we can get data back that either validates our decision-making or indicates a different direction that we ought to go. So on the whole, it didn't seem like characters were the best place to start. Interesting. What about new weapons? It could be really fun having a lot of gameplay variation. On the other hand, our players practice intensely with their favorite weapons, Lie. right down to learning the recoil pattern so that they can learn to compensate. They're not going to throw away all of that time investment and try something new just for the sake of variety. That means if we- Lol, they considered, oh my God. I mean, I, I probably this means uh, they, she just put it in the list, right? So, just so they considered it. But bro, this means you can you can buy an AK on the market, right? You can buy an RVP on the market, and then uh, people have default guns, and then there's guns that you can get for for money. Lol! Imagine, imagine, bro! Holy! They make new weapons. They have to have a unique tactical value that's nah. going to attract players to them. And really, there's only so many different options that we can provide that are meaningful in variety. And so actually, the value of shipping weapons goes down the more of them we ship, which is directly counter to our goal of providing lots of items. Wow. There's also a risk any time we ship new weapons that we're going to destabilize competitive play. That could potentially make yeah. our customers so unhappy that they just leave the game and never come back. Exactly. And that's the worst outcome that we can think of. There's a fair amount of resources required to do weapon balancing to attempt to mitigate that risk, on top of just the content work Lord. required to create the weapon mesh. Look at this AK! Holy silencer! So again, it looks like new weapons are maybe not our best place to start. So what about weapon mesh changes? Imagine if they concern. So I think she meant unboxing a stock. Unboxing a new... Uh, 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 Cross, uh, not cross here, unboxing a holographic, uh, whatever it's called, unboxing a silencer, and then you can apply it. <laughs> Bro, imagine if, if on the team there were actually some people trying to push that forward, and now CSGO, CSGO would have not been the same. Of course not. It wouldn't have been popular. It wouldn't have been compatible for pro play, no? Everybody would have been pissed. It would be pay to win. There's actually a surprising amount of benefit here. Um, After all, if you're changing your weapon, it's something you're holding in your hands. So even from the per first person view, you see your customization all the time. It's also something that could make other players more happy that you have it. Not only do they get to see something new and cool because you're walking around with the weapon, but if you drop it into the world, someone else can pick it up and play with it and have a positive experience. We did have a couple of doubts, though, so let's just see what those could be. So we actually got pretty far along this path. We customized the heck out of the AK-47. Uh, we played with it in-game, and what we did find that our concerns were validated. The first... Wait. Was this guy, what's his name? The guy that does the mods with like the, what is it like there? Hey, with the Licht, yeah, Lichtenstein, exactly. Bro, did Lichtenstein used to work at f***ing CSGO? This is exactly what he's doing, no? The RVP, blah, blah, blah. Lol, look at this AK, bro. <laughs> the f***ing magazine. Drum magazine. F***ing RVP scope on an AK. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. The first thing is that weapon identification is made a lot more difficult with all these different silhouettes. It's super hard to tell just by looking at these guys that the functionality for every one of these weapons is identical. And that brings me to my second ah. point. We were a little bit worried about how it would feel to have different components that didn't actually affect gameplay. Yeah. And the answer is that it felt really artificial. Yeah. In the real world, if you changed out things like stocks and grips, the weapon's recoil and accuracy would change. And the experience of getting weapon components that didn't affect the gameplay at all was actually kind of disappointing. <laughs> so we reassessed the risk even upwards from where we thought it was. 
There's also a bunch of work here, obviously, just to make the components. So that leaves us with weapon skins. At this point, we were getting actually really concerned because how many different camouflage weapons? Weapon skins, here we are. Can we make that people are really going to care about? But as we got further along gathering reference, we discovered that there's a whole world out there we weren't even aware of. Yeah. People make crazy things for their weapons, everything from uh, intricate Victorian scroll work right up to straight up graffiti. These things are essentially just blank canvases. Is that there's room for whimsy. That's not the case with our weapon mesh changes, where those things have to be based on real world components. For weapon skins, we can make pretty much whatever we can imagine. So the benefit is a lot greater than we first thought. They're also not Look, very there they had already the idea for the Desert Eagle Blaze album. Risky. There's a little bit of risk that the color changes would make the weapon identification a little more difficult, but on the whole, it's nothing compared to our other options. And then there's just the work of making the textures, which is less than any of other, our other options. It's also really easy for the community to make these easier than anything else. Yeah. So we have a pretty clear winner. In the real world, weapon finishes come in a vast array of styles and colors. So we already had a really good indication of how far we could go with creating variety. Now we just needed a way to make a lot of things really quickly. Since both our artists were technical artists, we did a very typical tech art thing. Instead of starting to concept what the weapon finishes might look like, oh. we jumped right into the task of trying to make them easier to produce. We started with the basic idea. Painting detail into textures takes a long time. It's a lot of work. And doing that on a large number of items seemed really inefficient, so we wanted to automate the process. Since CSGO's art style is fairly realistic, we started by taking a look at real-world reference. Paint wears off metal in a really predictable way, so there are certain effects that we know we want to reproduce. For one thing, it chips off the exposed corners and edges. It wears quickest where it gets the most contact, and grime and discoloration accrete in the cavities. And another thing is that when people paint their weapons, they typically don't. And here comes float into play. Wow. They take it from the real life reference. Your gun wears down. You, they, they check where the usual wearing spots are from IRL examples. And they apply that in the game. Boom. And it, and it is that way. On the M4A4, things that are more worn in game will be more worn. Uh, 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 that, are, that are worn. That easily get worn out uh, uh, IRL. Those spots as well are put by Valve uh, as well, that they get uh, faster worn the, the, the higher the float is. Bro, this is ridiculous, bro. Paint the whole thing. They're really careful not to get paint in the mechanism for obvious reasons. So each weapon has its own characteristic areas where the substrate, that's the original surface of the weapon, is always visible. <laughs> so in this case, only the, the receiver, the grip, and the I'm too excited. Are painted. What did she say? I can't, don't, I can't miss a singular second, sorry. It's only the, the receiver, the grip, and the buttstock have been painted. There is one thing about this example that isn't ideal, though, and it has to do with scale. This has a really durable paint on it, and so the way the paint chips off is in these kind of uh, larger chunks. That looks pretty cool on a rifle, but if you try to apply that to a pistol, it might look out of scale. And that's an important distinction, because we want to ship as general a solution as possible. Whatever we make, it has to apply to everything. So. Chad. I really wonder if she talks about the idea of whether, because it's, what's the number one question? If you buy your first expensive skin, you just booted up CS for the first time. Number one question is, will my gun go from factory new to battle scarred if I play with it, right? I was wondering when I had my first skin, everybody had that question. I'm wondering whether they considered implementing that. I think because it sounds like a valid idea. So we kept looking through our reference and we found an example where the wear pattern is filled with these smaller sized scratches. This indicates that this has a lower quality paint, but this scale of detail is going to work well on every type of weapon that we have. So we're gonna try and target this look. Wow. It's pretty easy to replicate all of these features as so long as we have good enough information about the topology of the mesh. In fact, the most important things to know are just the cavity and the occlusion. That's going to tell us our low points and our high points for the mesh so that we can figure out where the paint should chip first. For our scratches, we can just tile a texture over the entire weapon. We can start by just combining the cavity and the occlusion. The brightest areas are the places where the paint should wear off first. This is a pretty soft blend though, and our scratches need to have hard edges. So we can just use a smooth step in the shader to adjust the contrast. For the artists in the audience, a smooth step is really similar to Photoshop's levels operation. So this gives us our blend between our paint and our original substrate. 
Now's the time to bring in our, cap, our um, grime. We can just do that using the cavity. That tells us where to place the grime. And the grime itself is another tiling texture similar to the scratches. So next we'll add in the ambient occlusion to get the paint and the substrate to sit in the same world together. That's already looking pretty good. There's uh, one well, seven-year-old video. This is live. Problem though. And that's that there are a couple areas where we have some markings and etchings on the original weapon that really ought to show through. I don't think you can see it because it's a bit dark, but trust me, they're there. We want to see those even over the paint. So the cheapest thing we could think of was just to add them to the ambient occlusion. Since that's just getting multiplied over the surface of the paint anyway, we can get our details back um, in dark over the top. Thank so another thing that we saw in our reference was that the paint wears off quickest where it's touched the most. Only pixel, for There's something. no way to know um, where things get touched just from the topology of the mesh. It has to do with human interaction, so yeah. we need to have an artist's control over this. We added a wear influence texture that is artist created. For the most part, we just grabbed details from the original source texture PSDs, and then we just painted a couple of blobby details over the grip in the magazine with these big soft brushes. We spent hardly any time adjusting this mask at all. And this is the effect that it produces. You can see, especially on the grip, the paint is wearing where it's touched the most. Is that how it's actually executed now? I don't think so, right? I don't remember seeing like a, like a, like a hand grip uh, on the Battle Scott uh, M Force, no? Is this is the final version? Let me check. Because I don't know if this was before or after, uh, actually. Let me check M4A for Howell. No, I guess Zerka high float. Ah, boom. Zuck. Highest float Zerka. True! Right there, a little dick, aka uh, this is right where the hand grips around. Exactly the same. Sheesh. Interesting. So let's add lighting. So at this point, we've authored almost no, no new content by hand. The only things that we've created are really the grime texture and the scratch texture. And those things are going to be reused over every single weapon in the game anyway. The fun part is, since the shader um, has a wear input, we can just animate that input and wow. see the wear crawl over the surface. Wow. And this, this reminds me immediately, of course, this is exactly chat. What does this remind you of? The CSGO stash, of course. This is exactly how CSGO stash visualizes it. Well, I don't know if CSGO is involved with the site, but look, probably not, but boom. Exactly this reminds me of this right here. Suck. Oh, bro. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Vamo, bro, vamo. Great, because it shows that we can get a wide variety of looks just by editing a single shader parameter. It was around this time that we started testing the content in game under real game lighting. And what we found was a little bit concerning. So here's a typical first person view of a weapon. Um, I'm showing it without the world or the view model arms, just so you can focus on what's important. You can see that the way that this texture has been authored, it calls out all of the edges and plane changes so that even if we disable uh, directional lighting, all of the plane changes are obvious and you can understand the form really well. But what happens when we add our paint onto it? A lot of those plane changes nice just straight up disappear. Even with directional lighting, we still have a problem. Surfaces that have the same normal but different spatial offsets still look as though they've been merged into one. Huh? One of our concept artists is a big model-making nerd, so as we were figuring out the paint system, he recommended that we check out work by Mink Jimenez. I recommend this to any of you in the audience. If you're a texture artist, a shader artist, check this stuff out. He's got a lot of amazing techniques that are actually really helpful. He uses a technique called modulation. It gets painted on as part of the base coat before he adds the details, and it's used to call out geometric details, as well as edges and plane changes. So this isn't exactly lighting, although some of the directions of the gradients could be influenced by lighting. Instead, the goal is to create a value contrast at every single one of the edges. The details are painted on afterwards, and they reduce the obviousness of the effect, but the improvement in the viewer's understanding of the form remains. We tried it out. Truthfully, this was not at all fun. The process was just to grab an element and then planar map a gradient onto it. We then rotate the gradient until it's following the way that we want. Some of the more complicated weapons, like the machine guns, I swear, these things are like the Death Star. They have all these tiny little greebly bits on it. Some of them took up to two days. On average, about two hours per weapon. Oh, no. Sad valve. Up to two days of work? No. That's so much work. I the feel result, so though, bad. it works. Adding in the modulation shows us our plane changes again. That means that we can move forward without having to worry about the paint destroying the viewer's understanding of the form. We obviously don't want to just apply solid paints to every weapon, though. Huh? 
it's a pretty promising start, but uh, we researched a bunch of different finishing techniques and decided that our first technique would be inspired by hydro dipping. LOL. This technique uses a film with a printed pattern on it. It's floated into a tank of water. LOL! 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 Chat, what's the connection here? You tell me. Yes. Pattern template. Oh my god, bro. This is where the idea comes from. Hydro dipping, aka you take a pattern based skin like the AK case or like any case hardened. Boom. Hydro dipping. This is where the idea came from. That you take a pattern template, hydro dipping. Look the picture that he's showing. And then Boom. And you dip in the skin. You dip it into different positions, you get a different pattern. Oh my god. With an activator. The activator dissolves the film but leaves the pigment behind. And then you take your primed component and just roll it through the pigment to pick it up onto the surface. Oh my god. We imitate this in a super cheap way. <sighs> since hydrographics have seams in them from being I'm dipped. I'm gonna cry. I'm gonna cry. Oh, this interview. Oh my god. Chad, this is like, I don't know how to explain it to you. Chad, this is like history about the things that I'm living for, that I'm breathing for. Um, I could cry. This is how amazing these words are sounding right now. From multiple angles, and because the weapon's disassembled before it's dipped anyway, we can just tile a texture over our unwrap. If we have scenes in the results, eh, I just dialed up the realism. So you'd think that the first thing we try would be to replace the flat color from our prototype with a bunch of different textures, but that seems so single use. And in the long run, it didn't seem like a good first investment because we'd still have to create a lot of different images. So in order to be more efficient, we tried procedural coloration of patterns. I'm showing this to you really small because it's super hard in the eye. What is that? M4A4, that's multiple skins. This is in-game, right? This is, is this Urban DidiPad? I think it's Urban DidiPad. Huh? Wait, no. <laughs> Which one is it? Is it for real forest? It's for real forest. It's for real forest. It's for real forest. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. It's this one. It's this one. Yeah. That's the one. Literally right now in the game. Oh my god. And this got reapplied, of course, onto all different knives, different uh, uh, skins. m 5 s for real forest. Guys, authoring these again is not super fun, but once you have one, you can use it in a bunch of different ways. So you can change yeah. its scale, its orientation, drive different colors through it, and create a bunch of meaningful variation, again, just by driving some shader parameters. Yeah. We looked at- It's the same, sorry for, uh, for pausing the whole time. It's exactly the same, like how she explains, right? Uh, they don't, didn't want as much work or whatever, boom. Desert Eagle Hypnotic, for example. They always reapply things. What's this? Uh, what's the Glock called? Glock? Glock High Beam. Ah, boom. We have the Deagle Hypnotic, we have the Glock High Beam. It's exactly the same pattern. And it's for so many things. We have Slaughter Knives. Boom. Slaughter Knife. Bayonet Slaughter. Pattern Template right here. Keep this one in mind. We move on to any Dark Water skin. Look how many there are. Four different Dark Water skins. Boom. Exactly the same pattern template. Reused, resized, recolored. Boom. We had a bunch of different examples of hydro dipping, and we found that for the most part, people don't dip the entire weapon. They'll take certain components and just use an accent color on them. We thought that this look was more appealing than the head to toe camo. In order to replicate it, we paint a bunch of uh, paint by number textures for our weapons. So they combine with the patterns in order to create a weapon specific color mask. Uh -huh. The colorized paint ends up looking like this. Everywhere that's blue gets the same color. Everywhere that's green gets the same color. It transforms our head-to-toe cam camo gun into something... She left Valve in 2020 and is now self-employed. You might be able to hire her to design a skin for you, bro. Shut up. But maybe about, like, an, an interview or something. Like, ask maybe about some ins and outs. Do you think it would be possible to talk to her on stream? It's a little bit more appealing. The results of the composite can be randomized uh, by varying the rotation and the offsets of the texture. The wearer is randomized Whoa, 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 what is that skin? Oh my god, I want that. We don't have that in game. Uh, by varying the rotation and the offsets of the texture, the wearer is randomized also. And that means that every single item we generate with the system is per pixel unique. So this is all looking really promising, but this is a pretty expensive shader and it has a lot of texture inputs, meaning that it's pretty heavy on memory as well. What? So obviously it would be better not to run this thing every frame. In fact, we'd like to run it for just one frame and then save out the results. I don't know what that means. I've been showing everything so far in the context of the weapon meshes, but actually all of our inputs are just texture information. And so we can run this thing in a flat plane like a render target and still get the exact same results. Uh -huh. That's cool because we can just save this out and use it as a normal texture. 
That gives us an interesting advantage. It means that we don't have to edit any of the materials for our weapons. We can just swap out the base texture and still get all the variety that we want. So our first foray into generating the new texture through a render target wasn't all that promising. We had a two-second hitch every time we generated a weapon, Uh? which for a competitive game is plainly unacceptable. A what? So we asked for some help. We stopped trying to do everything with just technical artists and involved a rendering programmer. Uh Uh-huh. He made some optimizations to the way that we copy the information out of the render target and save it out. I'm not going to go into detail on this stuff. If you're interested, I can come back to the slide during the question period. The upshot is that it only takes about six milliseconds for a single frame, usually towards the beginning of a round when it doesn't matter. And then the rest of the work happens in a separate thread, so there's no gameplay hitch. Lol. So now that we have a fully functioning prototype, we felt confident enough to start creating some new styles. The first reference that we'd looked at consisted of spray-painted weapons. We started with hydrographics because it was easier to solve those problems. Um, here's the thing. With hydrographics, we don't care if we have scenes in the results. But with spray paints, really, they should be seamless. So normally we just do a, I catch jungle spray. a triplanar mapping. So we project the texture from the cardinal directions and then blend over the surface normals. This requires having mesh data to work with, though. And far from having the position and normal information from our mesh, I mean, what pre- we actually uh, have... My bad. It's just the flat plane of a render target with no normals at all. So what we actually need to do is get all of that position and normal information into a texture format. Now, the normal information is not that complicated. We just render an object space normal map. Um, But you should bear in mind that we never authored the UVs for any of these weapons for procedural solutions. In fact, all of the content had shipped to our customers months before. So there are some areas here where we have overlaps or mirrors in the UVs. This would be a problem if we were shading with this information, but actually it turns out to be plenty good enough for just doing the blend between the different texture projections. Our position didn't turn out quite that well. We need a lot of precision here in order for it to look accurate. We save out 32-bit uncompressed textures for the position, and it's still not enough. Uh We end up with some pretty serious blockiness in the mesh. Is this why Orb Lightning Strike was so ugly for all the time? I mean, no, they fixed it, I guess. The Orb Lightning Strike was one of the most lowest res f***ings ever. We solved this by multi-sampling. We just use a Gaussian kernel to average the positions, and the result is actually pretty credible. In terms of visual range, though, the difference between hydrographics and spray paints is not all that large, so we've managed to add some variety, but we want to go quite a lot further. Mm-hmm. As we were looking at our reference, we found that another common way that people customize their weapons is through anodization. Oh, our standard case shader for no. the weapons does actually let us achieve this effect, so we don't need to make any changes to the way we're rendering in-game. What we do is just tint the specular highlights by the base texture's color. And so we can get some nice juicy highlights like oh, this. Hot rot! So in this example, the paint's colored red and baked into the base texture, and then we just tint the specular highlights where oh. the paint appears and not over the substrate. It's pretty, but it looks really weird having it over the entire weapon. So remember that mask that we used to create accent colors for our hydrographics? We didn't use all the channels, did we? We still have one left. So we added another per weapon mask to limit the anodization effect. After the mask is made for a particular weapon... Oh, we need <laughs> I need that! Oh my god. Bro, this, this almost made it into the game, 100%. It is as well, this one, together with an m 4 s case hardened, those are all mentioned in uh, the workshop guide, where they explain how to use the workshop. Um, crazy. We got instead the m 4 s hot rod, and of course uh, the AK case hardened. Could have been m 4 s case hardened, m 4 for hot rod. Um, or both. Interesting. Creating a new anodized style is just picking a new color. Oh. We didn't stop there. How could we? We have so much texture information that has so many useful things in it. We haven't taken full advantage of it yet. So we added some more styles. We finally got around to creating an uncolorized hydrographic. Oh, <laughs> imagine! This one, these, are, these skins are all in the guide as well. The pictures that she's showing are all in the workshop guide as well. M4 for Blaze and, of course, M4 for Slaughter. Oh, imagine, bro. Our hydrographic and spray paint styles into anodized looks. We made a solid paint style just using our paint by number mask to uh, generate a paint that has up to four colors in it. And lastly, we created a patina style that instead of wearing down to the substrate, wears to a thicker patina. So smart. We didn't create any new per weapon texture inputs for any of these. We just remixed the stuff that we already had using our shader. I really want to stress that this is pretty much just procedural art. 
the cheapest kind Floats. of art that we can make. And it communicates the copper material really well. Is the video playing, guys? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, it communicates the copper material really well, and it also looks interesting and different at all the different uh, wear levels. And so we've managed to create a game, a bunch of variety, just by driving a single shader parameter. Yeah. How she says it, a game. And that's how I feel collecting low floats. It's a game. It's, it's, it's highest float, lowest float. It's so much fun. It's just fun. Oh my God. And they achieved that. I, I, I'm not gonna, it's, it's perfect. So to recap so far, we have a procedural compositing system that works at runtime that we can use to generate an essentially infinite number of textures. In order for the system to work, we need the following inputs. The original source texture, which was authored before we even had this idea. The cavity, AO, position, and normal. All of these things are just generated using out-of-the-box tools from our existing what mesh. We um, create a paint-by-number texture. Thank you for the That's done just by colorizing elements of the mesh and then rendering to texture, so it takes hardly any time at all. And then our artist-generated wear influence map. Now, we mostly just cribbed some layers from the original source texture PSD. So again, this isn't a big time investment. In fact, the only texture that took a significant time at all was the MIG Jimenez style modulation. This guy took, on average, about two hours per weapon. So if we add all these together, it took us about a half a day to create a <laughs> paintable weapon. Wow. Even with a Half a day. What the f How many skins did, did CSGO release this year? 34 skins. But probably, of course, it's not because they're lazy, right? They just want to keep the economy healthy, right? Don't want to... Uh, the less skins get released, the more skins uh, money gets put into the old skins, right? Because those are the only ones available to buy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Valve, thank you so much. Thank you. A really small staff of just a couple of artists, that means that we could blow through all 30 weapons in the game at the time uh, in about a week and a half. Now, this does look... And like they're busy on sauce too, right. ...an awful lot of texture inputs to our shader. Uh, some of them are grayscale, though, so we just combine them into a single texture by copying those into the texture's individual channels. Oof. The other component that we need, aside from having the weapon be prepped to be paintable, is the finish that we're going to apply to it. Yeah. What we author depends a little bit on the finish style, but for the most part, we create a pattern and then choose the colors for that pattern and then set just a couple of shader parameters like the specular intensity. Once all the weapons have been prepped, we can very easily author a single finish and apply it to any one of the weapons. Let me zoom in on our random one here no. and you can see all of the detail that's been procedurally placed. And I'll show you another variant just because they're so darn easy to make. So a single weapon finish can create a huge amount of variety, both by randomizing its parameters yeah. and by applying it to different weapons. At this point, it's time that we stop focusing on the tech and move on to the art. Huh? Over the course of gathering our reference, we discovered that people in the real world create hideous, hideous things. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Bro, what is that? <laughs> nah, Nova Bulldog. Oh, hell nah. It really begs the question, what do our customers want? The game's art style is grounded in the real world, and we've already gone down the path of replicating some real world finishing techniques. But there's a really broad range of service providers in the real world, creating a broad range of things that cater to a broad range of tastes. Bruh, Brony on the, on the magazine. Oh, in hell our nah. game world, we're the only service providers, and our taste might not match demand. So we needed to focus less on the things that we personally liked and more on creating a broad range of variety in order to measure people's reactions. We shipped things with a big range of aesthetics, and we no. deliberately shipped items that were contentious within the team. So among all these items, you can see a bunch of things that are people's least favorite out of all the test content that we made. We also shipped an in-game tool for creating finishes. Chad, were those skins all on release? Well, these, these were the release skins, right? Weapon case one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, look at this, bro. Some of the most legendary skins were the first skins. Uh, bro, AKK sound. Boom. The test content that we made. We also shipped an in-game tool for creating finishes yeah. that we call the Workbench. It allows the community to author weapon finishes for themselves and upload them to the community workshop. They've done that with enthusiasm, creating over 30,000 finishes. We've already started shipping some of the highest rated items, letting our community express their aesthetic preferences directly by just putting the things they make right into the game. We call our economy update the arms deal update, yeah. and it introduced the weapon finishes that people can collect and equip to customize their play experience. Our initial offering contained over 100 weapon finishes, all created in-house, 
which we've since expanded almost fourfold with the help of our community contributors. Each of these finish has random variations created by the pattern placement and the wear, meaning that there are actually tens of millions of unique items in our economy. Oh my God. Oh, it's so perfect, so smart. The three pillars of CSGO skins, pattern template, pattern indexes, so different variations of the pattern template, and then float. It's perfect, it is perfect. So checking back in with our goals, so far we've And they got it right from the beginning, you have to realize that, Chad. There were no adjustments. Once you create an economy, the economy is there. They, they nailed it from the start. It's, it's perfect how it is. To meet the first three, it's really easy to make a weapon finish. The community contributes to their creation, and we have a large variety of different looks. Our last two goals are to have a broad range of value and to create items that can be valued in different ways. So to know if we're meeting these two goals, we're going to have to check our data. Is she going to talk about rare patterns? Open finishes are, by definition, luxury goods. They're things that our customers like to have, but they're not actually necessary in order to play the game. In fact, they don't have any gameplay impact at all. There's plenty of academic discussion on the dimensions of luxury goods. I've collected together just a, a few of them that we can use to identify uh, what might contribute to the value of items in the economy. So let's start with conspicuousness. This uh -huh. is the public display of your status as a person with access to luxury goods. This is a graph of the sale of, uh, sorry, the sale price of a black laminate AK-47 over its first three months. This isn't privileged information. Anybody can see any graphs that look like this for any of the weapons in our economy just by visiting the marketplace. You can see that the price is pretty stable around $10. So that means that the community values this item pretty highly. Here's another item, the Doom Kitty Famas. Prices for this item started pretty high, around $750, and dropped really rapidly over just a couple of days. Now it maintains a fairly steady price of about $0.07. Cents. So this guy isn't a huge hit. <laughs> so what's so different between these two items? The, the, well, the finishes themselves... I'm going to give it a guess. The Farmer's Doom Kitty looks disgusting. They're superfluous. The weapons that they apply to aren't. So this is a graph of weapon utility over several rounds of the game. It shows which weapons get used uh, most frequently. The status from last October when we first shipped the economy. The AK-47 has the highest utility of any weapon in the primary weapon category. The M4 and the AWP are next uh, with roughly the same utility each, and then the rest of the primary weapons don't have a big share. So our FAMAS is the one that I prematurely pointed to. Um, that's the one from the previous slide that had a really low price on the marketplace. You can see it gets used a little bit in the beginning rounds of the game, but by the time we reach the later rounds, it has this tiny little share sandwiched between the much higher utility weapons. This shows us that if you have a fancy AK-47, you have a lot of chances to show it off. And if you have a fancy FAMAS, you don't. If we look at the prices of weapon finishes that have the same scarcity, we can see exactly this breakdown. Oh my the god. CSGO price over time by weapon. AK Black Lamb. Oh, okay. AK is on top, and then the M4 is in the op, and then a cluster of the rest of the weapons down below. This shows us that the amount of time that you spend holding a weapon influences its value quite a lot. That's just what we'd expect. More time holding a weapon means more chances to show off your customization, and mm -hmm. also to enjoy it for yourself. So conspicuousness That's is... That's why I say... Do you remember the clip chat here? What was it? One of our most uh, one of the most popular clips I've ever uploaded. I wasn't thinking uh, anything uh, about it yes, when I was uploading it. What was it? You don't need a CSGO knife here. Why? Why? Because uh, the gloves you always see. You hold your AK, you see the gloves. You hold your M4, you see the gloves. You whip out a nade, you see the gloves. Gloves always, always, always. Every single round, always there. Knife? Only when you pull it out. Only when you have time for it. Smell me? Mm -mm -mm. Definitely a big factor on price. That means that when we create a weapon finish, just applying it to different weapons can create a big range of value. The next item on our list, heritage and personal history, encompasses things like historic value, nostalgia, personal uh -huh. meaning. It's really easy to see how those kinds of things can influence the real world value of an item. Things like heirlooms, uh, items that belong to famous personages, items created as part of a venerable brand. But what about in a video game? Maybe it's less obvious, but Counter-Strike as a product has a 14-year history. This is the Desert Eagle, more commonly known by its nickname, the Deagle. It was a very popular choice in previous versions of the game, where it was a weapon with a very high utility. We have made some changes since, but last October, when we shipped our first round of content, 
the utility <laughs> of the what the f p250 ain't no way deagle in csgo was actually not particularly high in fact the utility of the p250 outweighs it quite considerably was it overpowered since that's the case uh we'd expect that the p250 would have a higher value but it doesn't the mm -hmm. deagle is actually the one on top it retains its high value because people are used to valuing it highly so this is an example that shows that heritage and personal history can actually affect players' valuation of items in a game. Interesting. Scarcity is easy to explain. The less of something there is, the more value each unit has. We'd sorted our items into collections. Each collection contains items from different quality tiers. The quality tiers correlate roughly with scarcity, so it's more common to get an item from a lower quality tier than an item from a higher quality tier. We do have two different types of drops. We drop cases and individual items. The cases can be opened with a key and it gives you uh, one item from a collection that's associated with that case. So this collection here is from a case and this one is made up of individual items. So we control the rate at which both the cases and the individual items drop relative to each other. The thing that we don't control is the rate at which cases are opened. We've used our best guess at case opening rates before shipping the economy in order to try and balance the number of drops so that our quality tiers would stay roughly correlated with scarcity. Um, but in our first couple of months, our customers opened way more cases than we'd expected. <laughs> and that means that case items are actually more common Sorry. than drops. So as a result, the quality tier of an item doesn't actually represent its scarcity relative to items that have a different provenance. So there are two items here that I particularly want to call your attention to. This is the red laminate AK-47 and the black laminate AK-47. Love the black laminate, f the red laminate. Visually, they're fairly similar. The red one is actually a little bit uh, punchier, so that's one way that we might have expected that it has a higher value, because it's more striking. Nope. Um, <clears throat> it also has a quality tier two tiers above the black laminate AK-47, so that's two ways in which we could expect it has a higher value. Except, due to the volume of cases opened, there are actually more red laminates in the world than black laminates. So the red laminate AK-47, which we expected originally to have a high value, is consistently around $4 cheaper than the black. Exacerbating this effect is the fact that if you have a red laminate... She says there's more in existence, but I wonder which, like, what is she referring to? 100% they have a... Chat, we have CSGO Float. We used to have CSGO Exchange. We used to have CSGO Zone. Skins databases, right? Community-made databases. But we can see how many black laminates have been registered by uh, by 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 uh, just crawlers right made by the community look they have as well probably their own system where they can see how many black laminates are in steam accounts how many bro this is so interesting i would love to like i don't know uh, talk to one of these people man I, have, I would have so many questions so many questions gaben if you're listening right now please hit me up on twitter ak-47 you're twice as likely to list it on the marketplace as if you have a black so scarcity's influence on price is pretty extreme. In fact, it's one of the clearest predictors of value that we have. There's one more interesting graph, uh, feature on this graph that I want to call your attention to. It's right here where the price of both of these items got depressed. Winter sale? This is actually on the date where we shipped a bunch of new weapon finishes, including mm. some for the AK-47. So the value of the older finishes um, actually decreased relative to the new, more unique, more scarce finishes. We have found over time that as the pool of items increases, this effect gets a little bit diffused. But when we first shipped the economy, it was a pretty obvious drop of a couple of bucks. We still see it today though. New case gets uh, released. Of course, people quick selling their shit, right? To open some cases. We see it nowadays with operations a lot. Operations because then everybody wants to buy the operation pass. Cases a little bit less. Excellent quality. In the real world, quality assessment would be polysensual. Kinetic feel and smell would give you indications as to the quality of materials and assembly. In our game world, our only indications are visual and descriptive, but we found to our surprise that they are just as influential. We expected that wear would influence desirability. Yeah. For one thing, we thought the worn beat-up weapons looked really cool because we're artists and we think that way. Hmm. Um, we also expected that the worn weapons would correlate with this kind of veteran status, a kind of fictional bonus on top of the aesthetic interest. Nah. They thought Battle Scout would may may and maybe more desired SFM. That's so funny to hear. Because of that, we considered making our weapons wear over time. <gasps> so that the more you use a weapon, the more worn it gets. There it is! Oh my god! 
what I was mentioning earlier. They did consider it. Holy smokes, veteran status. You use your AK, k uh, hardened in game. You start at faction new. This is where it's unboxed when it lands in inventory, and it wears down, and it becomes a veteran status at battle scar. Oh my god, bro. <laughs> That's crazy. Pretty much everybody we showed the tech to had the same idea. It was a really popular idea. We wanted players to show off their worn weapons as badges of honor. We ended up not doing it for two reasons. The first reason is that some of the paints look better with less wear rather than more, or at least that's how we assessed them. And so it would be really difficult yep. in order to get the uh, weapons to always wear towards an ideal state. The other thing is that in order for people to show off worn weapons as badges of honor, uh, they have to represent a significant time investment. And that means that the wear could happen too slowly for our players to perceive. Now, we don't want to affect people's inventories in a way that's difficult to communicate. And so we ended up not shipping that. Instead, each item Shit, had... this blows my mind, bro. In a different universe. Oh, skins actually were... Oh, my God. This blows my mind right now. Am I the only one mind blown? I feel like to some of you, it doesn't kick as much. This, is, this blows my mind right now, bro. Hearing this out of their mouth. The people who actually were pushing the buttons could have released it. We're thinking about releasing it. Oh my God, bro. Has a random amount of wear applied to it at grant time. The wear has a, a bell curve so that it's, um, it's most common to get an item with just a middling amount of wear. So the items with the most and the least amount mm -hmm. of wear have the most scarcity. Given our previous bell curve, uh, just uh, you know, for quick understanding, boom, field test, uh, or 0 0.07, yeah, field test, yeah, field test, it has, uh, it does, it looks weird here, huh? Or yeah, yeah, field test, yeah, yeah, this is bell curve. It looks weird though. It looks weird. I don't know why they put no this no, yeah, but it, it look if bell curve, zack, you know, field tested much more likely. As you can see, 0 0.15 to 0 0.38, and then you have here FN just a 0 0.07 range, yeah. Mm -mm -mm. In these examples, then, we could expect that the items with the most and least amounts of wear would have the highest value. If that were true, our graph would look like this. Wait, what's she saying? Sorry activity. so much. Given our previous examples, then, we could expect that the items with the most and least amounts of wear would have the highest value. Yeah. If that were true, our graph would look like this. We have Battle Scarred on the left and Factory New on the right. You'd think that there would be an uptick in value uh, for both of those just because of scarcity. But almost without exception, the battle scarred exteriors, our most worn exteriors, are seen as significantly lower quality than the factory new finishes. This definitely shows that the impact of quality valuation uh, affects the price on the marketplace. So creating our scratched aesthetic did actually give us a broad range of value, even if we had originally imagined the value spread exactly backwards. So let's finally talk well, about- I wanna, Chad, you always want inventory reviews from me, right? I want to have an inventory review from her looking at my number one highest float skins and then I nerd out on it and I say like, yes, this is look and I have two different ones that have the same float, exactly the same float. They're both number one, different pattern decks, not duped. Oh my. Oh, but the aesthetics of individual finishes. Aesthetics in the context of luxury is a consumer's ability to discriminate value just based on visual characteristics. We created a broad range of aesthetics from subdued military styles all the way to flashy items that were shiny. The so because the, the game can have a stealth component to it, we actually oh. expected that players sorry would prefer to items that they felt gave them a camouflage. So how do we test our assumptions? We can't just look at price on the marketplace. It's way too heavily influenced by all the other factors on this list. It's also worth noting that the price on the marketplace doesn't capture the total value of the items in our economy. Less than 2% of our items are listed on the marketplace. Wow. The rest of them are collected and equipped, and they provide a value to their owners that isn't expressed in dollar amounts. So let's look at some... This is an interesting... I could, I could make an interesting tangent here. The one thing... for I, I know it becomes degen, but NFTs... I know, sorry. But NFTs, one of the things that people always look into, like I've heard, uh, like I, I have friends that invest into NFTs, and one thing that we always said, listing percentage. What she just mentioned, right? Only 2%, was it 2%? Only 2%, was it 2%? Are listed on the market. It, it, it's important to check on NFTs, like if 50% of the items are listed, let's say 50% of all AK redlines would be listed for sale. AK, nobody wants them. Nobody like wants to keep them. Everybody wants to quickly get rid of them. Interesting that she as well talks about that. On market data. Oh. We added crafting to the game shortly after the economy went live. <laughs> crafting? 
Nah. Look at <laughs> the innocent signature. Okay. <laughs> she wasn't aware that everybody was about to just draw some big, fat, juicy ass cocks. You already know. Crafting is just taking a number of items and trading them in with the game instead of with another player in order to get a different item back. We use the fiction of a contract with the arms dealer. It's essentially a way of trading in with the game controller instead of the player, and we use specific contracts that define which items can be crafted into which other items. We've organized our items into so you collection. have to remember, like, you don't think about this. Like, you just take it as a given. Trade up context, yeah, you put 10 skins, you come one out. No, they all have to set, they have to set the perfect variables. Who decides that you put in 10 skins into trade up contact and not five, not two? Those are all perfectly aligned. Metrics, oh my God. Float ranges, then it's a bell curve, not just linear or whatever. Oh my God, man, it's so smart. I can't. And we allow players to trade up inside of those collections. 10 items from one quality tier will get you a random item from the next tier up. We can identify our most desired items by looking at just a couple of factors. For one thing, we'll look at our crafting data. We can see which items are traded in more frequently than usual. We can also look at the origin of an item. If lots of them are created via crafting, we're either looking at the item that was desired, or we're looking at an item in the same tier as the one that you hoped you got, or we're looking at an item that's transitional. It's something that someone crafted in order to work their way towards a yet higher tier. I would love to look into these databases. Did you just hear what she just said? They can look into the percentage of blah, 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 for example, uh, this randomized Nova that gets traded up, the most popular trade up skins, everything. All databases, all info that they can look at that we have no access to. I would love to have a look behind the curtains. Oh my God, of CSGO. So if we look only at the items that are created via crafting but not subsequently traded in. Chat, sorry for pausing the whole time. Oh, should I try? No. I thought about like just emailing CSGO, just emailing them, see what's up, you know? They, they know that we are talking about CSGO skins all the time. Uh, maybe like, you know, more people are interested in skins as well. Like surely they would be like, I don't know. Imagine like, oh, like a vlog in Valve's office. Ah, boom. Ah, yeah, here we're working on Source 2. Don't show Jimmy, he's working on Source 2. <laughs> oh my God. Oh bro, man. oh my God, bro. Behind the scenes. Uh, this gives us a pretty clear picture I of the favorite them. items from this collection. We can further narrow aesthetic preferences by looking at equip rates. Um, Items that are equipped at an unusually high rate that are also worked towards via crafting give us our best picture of our most loved items. Equip rates. So for example, if you own a Desert Eagle with the Cobalt Disruption finish, you're 16% more likely to equip this one than any other finish, oh even goodness. if you have lots of them. So if we look only at the craft targets that satisfy these two qualifications, we actually end up with a pretty small list. Oops, sorry. No problem. So people like anodized finishes a lot. More than half the items on this list are either anodized or metallic. They also like saturated colors on black or very bright finishes. And they also like weapons that have a sleek kind of spy movie aesthetic. The easiest thing to see though, looking at all of these items is that most of them have a single predominant color. I should note that this is really different from looking at price on the marketplace. Although some of these items do have a high price on the marketplace, that's not true for all of them. In fact, some of them are worth only about 50 cents, and some of them are worth as much as uh, sorry, $30. $30? Lol, that's so much money for a CSGO skin. 30 bucks? Holy shit. I'm so happy that nowadays like the times are different and that we're looking at, I don't know, like, that's just ridiculous. Scarcity also that? isn't reflected very well here. Some of these items are really rare, and some of them, there's a lot of them in the world. So looking at crafting and equip rates for these items gives us a new window into what players value about our economy. She costs. showed the fire serpent as well, no? A $30 fire serpent. Ay, ay, ay. So this covers the high end of our aesthetic range. What about the low end? Everybody starts with the default loadout. As you play, you get drops of weapons with finishes. The first time you get one, you are 90% likely to equip it. At least Love that's it. true for most weapons. For some of them, even when you get it, you dislike it so much, you'd rather have the default. If we look only at the rejects, we can see, again, a pattern. These are all camouflage inspired. In fact, these are all items that look like our original inspiration. So although we started off thinking that the military camouflage was really cool, it turns out that what our community really values are finishes that look more like paint guns. Go crazy. 
It was great. We needed a reminder. I love how we went of- from how, how they thought that we would like this and everything, right? And now we are in a world where, where this is the thing. <laughs> sort of kiss love. A boom. Jawohl, let's go. Nah. Which was really cool. It turns out that what our community really... <laughs> they did not know what we like. <laughs> ...values our finishes that look more like paint guns. It was great. We needed a reminder that although Counter-Strike is military-inspired, it's not a military simulation. It's a sport. When our customers play, yeah. they don't aspire to be soldiers. They aspire to be elite Counter-Strike players. So maybe it's not that surprising that the closest real-world analog we've got to our preferred aesthetic comes from a sport. I do sports. I play Counter-Strike. If you looked at our content, you'd assume that we understood this right from the start and decided to put the bright items at the top of our quality tiers because we thought they had the most value. Actually, that wasn't what we were thinking. It was a risk mitigation strategy. We were genuinely worried that people wouldn't like the bright items. So instead of thinking of these as being sorted by value, we originally sorted them by risk. Hmm. After all, if you got a rare item, you'd like it because it was rare, even if it was an aesthetic that you didn't appreciate. And for everybody else, if they don't have a rare item, they're happy because they don't have to see the bright stuff very often because there aren't very many of them in the world. Well, now we know we were wrong. Mm-hmm. Would that have changed our design? It may have. Huh? And let me explain how. Oh, let's see. We need to properly map out our design space. We can think of the facets of luxury as the axes in that space. We've figured out the bounds of the axes by examining our data. Conspicuousness varies with the utility of the weapon. Scarcity, um, oh, sorry, heritage and personal history from the novel to the familiar. Uh, scarcity varies with supply as well as how frequently you encounter an item, um, sorry, a finish for a particular weapon. Uh, quality varies from our original scratch aesthetic to factory new. And our aesthetic style, which was the most difficult for us to tease out of the data, varies from our original military aesthetic to visually salient sports-inspired styles. The last thing that we want is for all of these axes to be aligned, collapsing our design space. That would be possible if we didn't understand how these axes were defined. In fact, we'd align scarcity and aesthetics by putting most of our visually salient items at the top of our collections. Fortunately, our design space has more than just those two axes, or we could have had a serious problem. What? The worst scenario is that each item in the economy has all the facets of a luxury good, each in equal degrees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That doesn't include... Imagine a case where it's all flashy skins and so on. Now she's talking about the lower... Like, there have to be some skins that do look worse. Shit. Interactions in which players both feel they're getting the better end of the deal. Someone's always going to be ahead of you on the ladder and somebody behind. And there's only one direction to trade in that makes any sense. That is the best way I can think of to stifle the economy. Instead, what we'd like is to have ways to create value in every axis. Understanding not only what the axes are, but how uh, to place an item along it lets us determine if we're providing enough variety of value. Ideally, there wouldn't be any items in the economy that had perfectly equal value on every axis. Having that range of value is really important. We can create a range of items that have different value on different axes, and then players with orthogonal goals can trade with each other and each feel like they're getting the better end of the deal, even if the total value of the items is unequal. So I could, for example, want to collect rare items, but maybe I don't care if they're bright or shiny. Or I could want to collect items that are bright colors, but maybe it doesn't matter to me if they're factory new. Those trades can happen even if the value is unequal, and players with different goals can value different items in different ways. So the finer we slice our axes, the more nuanced trading and marketplace transactions can get. By creating our content in a semi-procedural way, we were able to slice our axes very fine indeed creating a broad range of value and creating value on multiple axes. So with our players exchanging over 30 million items with each other on the marketplace so far, it certainly seems like we've met our goals. Wait, wait, wait. What was that? Multiple axes. So with our players exchanging over 30 million items with each other on the marketplace so far, wow. it certainly seems like we've met our goals. So let's wrap up by checking back in with our product level goals. We'd hope that the economy would improve the longevity of our game, provide fun and value to our customers, and make it easier for our customers to provide fun and value to each other. And God, in my opinion, like this, absolutely no. Long-term goals for the CSGO, improve longevity for the game. Without skins, would CSGO be right now where, 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 where it is? Probably not. 
Probably, I wouldn't be here. I think I wouldn't be here. If I'm being fully transparent, I, I, I would probably still play CS, but I wouldn't play 24-7, play, consider playing no other game and just talking about CSGO 24-7. You know? I would be probably uh, playing, I don't, I don't even know. I would probably be playing League of Legends. I'm not even kidding. Ilao top lane, you already know. Number one EU. Remember that we only have to check in on a couple of broad metrics to see if we're meeting our goals. It's our player numbers, player retention, and our individual play times. Oh, what the f Is this when they release skins? There's no way. It's taken from steamgraph.net. It's a community website that monitors the uh, numbers we publish about who's playing what on Steam. No, no, it shows not. our peak concurrent player numbers daily. So here's some notable landmarks. Here are the games in beta. Okay, sorry. <laughs> this is the launch of our game. I will shut the f Here are a couple of free weekends. This is the Steam Summer Sale that preceded the economy launch. That's it? How much is that? It went from like 30k, 36, yeah, 30, 30k-ish to like 50k. I mean, that's crazy. So after our economy launch, we had a pretty dramatic increase in peak player numbers, bringing us to regular highs that we'd only achieved previously by making the game temporarily free. Temporarily free? This last free? spike here is DreamHack. It's a big tournament for CSGO with a high viewership. But this what? Was... DreamHack got m this many more new players and this is the CSGO skins update? LOL. I thought skins would be like, pew. Nah. Also on, uh, our game was also on sale for this time period, and that caused a huge player spike, nearly doubling our player count. There was a large influx of new players around this time, and they stuck around at a really high rate. In fact, they stuck around at a much higher rate than players from previous sales. And so we can see that uh, not only are our player numbers up, but our player retention is up. Since that, that event, we've been able to reach a new plateau of about 100,000 peaking current players daily and about 2.3 million monthly unique players. In the aggregate, it certainly looks like we've met our goals for adding the economy, and individual players are sending us the same signal. They're playing more frequently and for longer, which is our best indication that we're providing them with lots of fun. And as they continue to play together and exchange items with each other, they're creating loads of value for each other as well. Our one remaining goal is that we increase the longevity of the game. Now only time will tell, but with such a large community of returning players, CSGO's future looks really bright. Oh. Goosebumps. Like I literally... Ah, but you said she... Brown Run Grimes. Brown Run Grimes. Twitter. Oh, is that her? Brown? No, that's not her. That's not her. I think she has it. Floor for questions now. So if you have questions, please step up to the mics. Hi, Brown Run. Uh, Hi. Ooh. Can we have a little light in here for the audience? Audience yeah, questions. You mentioned, you mentioned that there were only two technical artists, yourself and one other, working on CSGO to bring the economy update mm -hmm. about. How big was the rest of the team? And I'm particularly interested uh, in uh, how the decisions were made to either proceed or not proceed with doing the economy in the context of how many people there were. So we had, let me think back, around the time, we probably had about 12 people on the team total. And I don't think that changed much. I don't think that changed much. Holy f**k. CSGO, 12 people. What the f**k? And you have to remember, chat. 12 people were on the team when the game was launched and super close to what we have right now. Like, uh, uh, the amount of work spent on those 12 people compared to everything that came until now that those 12 people did everything, right? They put the foundation for the game, they created the economy, they did everything. All that came after that was new guns introduced, new skins, new weapon updates, uh, some engine updates, of course. That is crazy. 12 people creating CSGO. Ain't no way. Today, one um, employee. That, <laughs> that team size has increased since then, which is good because it means we can How many? do more stuff. Um, but everyone was, was really behind the economy. I mean, looking at the success of TF2 and Dota 2, we really wanted to improve our player numbers. Um, it, typically, after you launch a product, the, the product cycle goes like this, right? You have this big spike at launch, and then it just continues downwards until you have this long tail. Um, TF2 and Dota 2 both have this big spike, and then they just keep going up. And that's the model that we wanted to, to go for, right? So um, pretty much everybody on the team was really pulling for the economy. It wasn't like we just had technical artists going, hey, let's make an economy. <laughs> yeah, it was a whole team decision. W. 
Next question. I have question. some uh, links that you guys might want to check out. No questions? No, no. Nobody cares. Oh, if I would be in the crowd, bro. One more question, please. Please, just one more. Please, don't go yet. One more question. <laughs> bro, nobody has questions. Hi. Just one more question. Um, mm -hmm. You have this game mode where you uh, unlock... Um, like That's me. ...further weapons, the, the more kills you earn, right? Uh, where you, like, start with a pistol and then you perform your first kill and then you uh, use the machine gun and whatnot. Right, I'm so there's, there's an in-game economy that's a game mechanic that's totally separate from this kind of meta economy. And uh, what happens is if you make a kill, you earn more money in-game, which allows you to buy a more expensive weapon later on. No, and that, that's actually a good catch because that graph that I was showing about weapon utility, it wasn't actually showing the rounds sequentially. It was showing how much money you had to buy a weapon at the start of a round. So it's not exactly what I said it was, but I didn't no, want to explain the mechanic. I meant the certain the, the special game mode where you like start with the pistol and then you arms race. One kill oh, then, you're um, talking about the, the arms, arms race? Yeah. Did you like look at stats of players that like only play this particular game mode and Who how cares? the like purchase of weapons differs uh, for for those players in comparison to like deathmatch players or so? Um, so there aren't actually a lot of players that play exclusively arms race. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, our our players here. I totally have a slide for this. Um, if I can get my cursor back from the. What a stupid screen. question. Sorry, sorry. Um, so we, we actually have different populations of players. Let me see if I can find this slide. It's way, way at the end here. Um, so we have players who they mainly break down into three categories. They break down into players who play uh, on uh, casual, players who play on competitive, me? and players who play on community servers. You and guys. so uh, arms, arms race is going to fit into the casual section of our players. And we didn't really break it down a lot further from there because the populations got really, really small. It's a shit game mode, sorry. Okay. Uh, thanks, Bronwyn. Um, I wanted to ask, now that uh, CSGO is kind of in a different place than when you decided to start doing um, uh, weapon skin as items, if you've got, if you guys have considered any of the other uh, kind of more resource-intensive um, expansions to it, um, that stuff is always on the table. It's just a matter of um, making sure that we have a, a goal for it. We don't want to ship something just for the sake of it. We want to work towards actually improving the customer experience. And um, mm. I mean, you might be thinking of things like the the character customization. Um, Agents. Until we can solve the team ID problem, that that wouldn't be something that we would want to ship. So sure. there, nice. there's a lot of which means they may have solved the team problem a couple of years ago. Agents, boom, got released. Work to do there. Uh, that doesn't mean that we won't consider it. Okay, cool. Thanks. Whoa, right, right, right. On your um, um, on your graph there for the DreamHack, you ah. notice the spike in players staying online. Now, did you guys have the esports? Uh, line of your economy plan before you notice that spike or after? Oh, absolutely before. Yeah, absolutely before. So um, for those in the audience that don't know, we sold a special key for a special case. It was called the eSports case. Um, we've actually had a couple in that series so far. And what that case does is we take a portion of the proceeds from that case and we use it to fund community tournaments. DreamHack was actually the first recipient, and they had a $250,000 prize pool that was funded by our community. Wow. And so the community was actually heavily invested in it in order to you know, go watch it and see the, the results of something that they'd been caring about all this time. That's what Dota still does, and that's why they have $44 million prize pools, the biggest prize pools in esports, which is ridiculous. Now, CSGO, sadly... I wish, bro, imagine, imagine, imagine like a CSGO major, blast France, and then boom, $40 million prize pool. Wrong? Not wrong. They, they, they put money, not from the cases, like they, they, I don't know if they have cases, but they put money from the Dota Battle Pass or whatever, right? That goes into the prize pool. Wow. Now, of course, sticker money goes to the teams directly, but it just, chat, like, I'm now wondering... Why not instead of just giving the sticker money to the players, right? And uh, th that number just goes under the table. Why why not just like say, oh, like we give the money uh, to the players and then it's like, you know, boom, it's a f $10 million uh, uh, major, another $1 million major, but everybody gets sticker money. I don't know. It could be so nice for hype and everything. Maybe they just want every player to get nice money and not just, you know, not just, not just the winners of a tournament.
I don't know. What are you saying? Do you not mean? Uh, do you not get what I say? And actually, we just had the second one, which was EMS one in Katowice. What they should do, though, no, is take money from people buying the the major pass or whatever. What is it called? The f major. Yeah, when you, to do your pickups and everything. Imagine, boom. Even if it's just twenty five percent, I don't know the percentage in Dota two. If it's like some percentage goes to the price pool of every single major, a fixed amount. Imagine, bro, ten million dollar France. France uh, major, oh my god, bro, it would just be, it would just be nuts. Viewer pass, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, that was just last week. Um, what our was peak it, Kato was EMS one in Katowice. Oh, sh uh, that was just last week. Um, our peak concurrent uh, player numbers during that event went up to 165,000. So, and we were also on sale. So we'll see how many of those players oh, come so back happy. over the next couple of weeks. I'm uh, actually kind of excited because I think we're going to reach a new plateau. Okay, thank you. Hi. Uh, I know in the past few months you've also shipped an update that allows players to apply stickers to their guns. Yes. And uh, one, I'm, I'm a big Counter-Strike player myself. And, awesome. Uh, so are a lot of my friends. But I found that they're a lot more polarizing than the skins. And I was wondering if that was something you guys knew going into shipping that update. No. <laughs> we, we had no idea they'd be polarizing. We thought people would think they were really cool. Um, there's... You have to be careful when you're talking about things being polarizing because there's some data that you can get anecdotally that isn't actually represented in players' purchasing behavior. And so there's a large community, or actually a large community of players that, that never speak up, right? That are perfectly happy with the things that they get. And so when we're looking at um, things to add to the game or assessing you know, whether something was, was valuable and whether it's working, we can't just look at what people are talking about in the forums, although we obviously do read that stuff all the time and take it into account. We also have to look at how um, our players' behaviors are changing and whether they're actually consuming the content and enjoying it. And it turns out that people actually love stickers. <laughs> I yeah, love for stickers. the most part, anyway. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I want some more details on that. Um, in CS 1.6, you guys had uh, spray paint on the world, right? Yes. Have you guys considered adding uh, user customized spray paints, which are obviously no. you guys will have to monitor what goes in and what goes out, goes out and the ability to Maybe like uh, if I didn't like a spray paint and I was playing the game, I could uh, actually spray something on top of that and kind of hide it and so on. Would you, did you guys consider something like that? So um, there were a lot of abuses of the original system because there wasn't any sort of gating system. You could just put in whatever you wanted. And so there were a lot of obscene images just sprayed around mm. the world and actually... Um, Boop, sticks, pop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my favorite and the worst is that people would take a picture of themselves they're in you know a weapon pose standing against a wall and then they would spray it on the wall uh -huh. and then other players would come by and start like targeting to Classic. shoot there and, uh, you know so it was like this this weird strategic kind of emergent gameplay sort of thing um we're not sure how much value sprays have relative to some of the other things that that we could do i know that people do want them back because they're well again it's kind of a, a heritage thing people are, are used to having them but we haven't um made any decision one way or the other All right, thanks. well we have graffitis now not the custom well, ones but... i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how knives factored in uh were they always supposed oh. to be the ultra rare uh kind of item from these cases and obviously their effects are just aesthetic so um, knives, yes, we, we always plan to make them the most rare items. And the reason is that these are weapons with an extremely high utility. You yeah. use them in every single round of the game. You whip them out all the time because whipping them out makes you run faster relative to carrying a, a heavy weapon right in front of you. Um, we thought that just giving them out um, would, be, would be kind of a waste because there was such an opportunity to, to drive value by making them rare and, and desirable. Bro, how how is it so perfect, Chad? The things that could have went wrong in them doing small mistakes when releasing a, an economy they didn't have any data. Look, the knife could have been I don't know, could have been a low tier. Or, uh, bro, it's just perfect. It's just all perfect. It's just so smart. She is so smart, and the whole team behind it. And um, we even see within these guys that there's a value spread, like uh, all the different finishes. The fade is the most popular, and then the slaughter, and then the karambit is the most popular. Karam? Item, so. <laughs> yeah, you hear? This is how it actually is supposed to be pronounced. You hear it from CSGO themselves. She created it. Fade is the most popular, and then the slaughter, and then the karambit is the most popular knife. And so there's a good range of value here, too. Um, it, it's a little bit worrisome because the value of these items is so high. 
actually for a long time we were watching the price of them just keep rising on the marketplace, which is really scary because we, we have a cap on the marketplace yeah. uh, of, of four hundred dollars. So if you back in the day it was four hundred? I thought it was eight hundred or something. That's so interesting to hear from her. I wonder if she's gonna mention third party marketplaces. Was OP skins big back in the day? Oh f this could get interesting. We only have three more minutes. You have an item that's worth more than four hundred dollars. You you can't actually get the value of yeah, it yeah, from yeah. the marketplace. Yeah. And so people end up doing things like taking their knives and trying to sell them on eBay, and they get scammed and? all the time. And it's it's not really all that positive for players. Um, finally, the price is stabilized, and now they're around like two hundred bucks. <laughs> so so we feel a little safer. But um, yeah, we we always plan to make those the the highest tier items. And I didn't talk about them very much because interesting. Interesting, interesting. So probably she was fuming when they realized, oh my god, boom, Dragon Law all of a sudden, zack, above the market cap. And then third marketplaces come up, cash outsides. Oh, wow, 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 wow. Because they don't really fit into any of the collections or any of the other things that we talked about. And they have such a high scarcity and such a high utility that they're just off the charts on pretty much all of our other ranges. Thank you. Mm -hmm. By the way, there's still people buying and selling skins on eBay. Sometimes I just search for CSGO knife on eBay and there's always people like showing a screenshot of a butterfly knife or something. And they sell like the knives on eBay, bro. Nah. Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> I was curious about, uh, so you have some weapon skins that are tracking in terms of kills. That's right. Oh, yeah. And how does that play into, I guess, like the aesthetics of the weapon and everything? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That thing. <laughs> <laughs> um... Well, so we call these items stat track items. They're kind of like the strangers from TF. It tracks how many kills you get. So I, I think in TF, um, your strange weapon just tracks it as, as part of the name or description, and you don't actually see it as, like, it's not on your weapon. We created modules, or, like, especially on the knives, they have these little scratched off bits where you can actually see it on the weapon, and people really seem to like that. Um, we have found that the value of these things... Um, there is some value there just for intrinsically, they're, they're fun to have, but most of the value of them on the marketplace comes from their scarcity, which is sort of interesting. So it's another way that we can generate a range of value. Um, 10 times rarer. Does that answer your question or was there? Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Um, so you have uh, Dota 2 and TF2 that are both free to play games? Yes. So when you guys develop the economy, are you able to say what? some of the tension that you were running into, maybe making CSGO free to play or not? Let's see. Um, that, that's a question that we get a lot. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that we're concerned about that's stopping us from going free to play mm -hmm. is cheating. <sighs> right now there's a friction. If someone gets caught cheating, they have to rebuy the game in order to come in and keep ruining other people's experiences. Uh, if the game's free to play, there's no friction at all. They can just keep rolling over accounts. And so until we solve that, that problem, um, we probably wouldn't go free to play. Well, <laughs> problem not solved, we still made it free to play. <laughs> oh, shit. It's something that we talk about all the time. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Do you make the same kind of uh, assessments when choosing uh, map, map workshop levels? Huh? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Bro, map workshop. Oh, no, this is like, this is like T-Rex, in the who's map designer, bro. Come on, man. Bro, we talk about skins about here. There's skins, come on. Orb Dragon Law, what do you like? Bro, map? Hello? Come uh, on. Map, map workshop levels. Oh, like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there, there are different things that the, the different maps bring. There are some maps that are just absolutely gorgeous, and they, they draw people into those worlds. And there Vertigo. are some maps that are, you know, slightly less gorgeous, but they play really fantastically. Mirage. What we do find is that the, um, the value of the maps to the community uh, is almost all about play. It, like, if they play really well. So uh, you guys, if you're Counter-Strike players, have probably heard of Cash. Um, it's a really popular map. It's a community-created map that has um, a, a really good play style to it. So that one's really popular compared to some of the other maps that might be visually more attractive. Rest in peace. Um, but they aren't as popular because the, the gameplay isn't quite as strong. No, don't end. All right, I think we're out of time. No. So thanks everyone. Oh, what, Chad, what the, this is, oh man. I could listen to Valve employees forever. This is Loki, a historic talk that influenced a lot of the concepts in microtransactions to now, today and now PCGMs. Yes, nobody did it like them.